Hello there and greetings. Welcome to edition number 36 of Joy Sightings. And today I read from Tales of the Resistance by David and Karen Maines, the last chapter, the twelfth chapter, entitled The Burning Place. The Enchanter's time has come the time for which he has so long waited. The power to end the influence of his hated challenger has fallen into his hand, the time when he will send his rival into final exile, into death itself. To the burning place, shouts the enchanter. His cry pierces the night. The heralds quickly echo the sentence of doom. Death, they shout. Death, death as the drums beat an awful agreement. Oomphapa, oomphapa, oomphapa din! And the people standing in traffic court watch the proceedings and chant. Burn him, burn him! There's no such thing as a king! Death to pretenders! The flames, the flames! Then the burners close round the man, their eyes beneath their dark hoods glow like gruesome embers set in coal. Their pokers flash red hot, now prodding, now poking, thrusting, wounding, searing brands without mercy. Death, death, cries the chief herald. Burn, burn, jeer the people. To the burning place, screams the enchanter again. As the dreaded procession begins, each man, woman, and child is drawn to the great mound of ashes on the edge of the city. Each vendor, each merchant, each worker within sound of hearing of the drums responds to the call, Oomphapa, Oomphapa. As though by some dark magic, death captivates the citizens, beckoning them to the burning pyre to witness this drama of despair. Din, din, um papa, um papa, um papa din. The burners form an inner circle around the man, prodding him with hot irons. Breakers stand in an outer ring and push him with their cruel cudgels whenever he falters. Mercilessly they escort him from the central dagoda, through the dark streets, past the heraldry posts, across the marketplace. Burn, burn, the crowd still cries. The children chase each other, skipping in time to the signal drums, chanting as they run, Burning place, burning place. To burning place all come, where the ashes rise in choking clouds kicked up by the tromping mob. A pyre is readied in the center of the death field and a stake erected thrusting solidly toward the deep night of the sky above Enchanted City. A momentary silence, then the death drums roll anew. Fire priests circle the central pyre. The mob of breakers approach. Rough hands lift the victim's battered body to the structure. The common cloth is torn from him. Shoulder to ankle, his hands are bound behind the stake, His ankles tied, his head now sags. Fire priests prance the ceremonial steps. The bells sewn to the hem of their robes accent the rhythm of the death beats. Jang, jang, jang. Slowly, slowly, they step round and round the pyre, preparing for the sacrifice. Then silence, ominous silence, as a single drum is beaten. Din, din. Din. In the hush, night presses on the heart, the lungs, the mind. The ashes of a thousand burnings scorch the nostrils of people who push forward to see, to watch. And the subjects of the city understand at last. Death touches all. Breathes on each, whispers in each man's ear. All come to burning place. One sooner, one later, but all come. 
Now the enchanter's limousine, long, sleek, black, silent, draws to the edge of burning place. The enchanter emerges, his eyes hot with anticipation, his robe an image of woven flame. All clear a wide path for him. None wish to touch him with his heat or feel his burning gaze. But he has eyes only for one, for the mauled figure tied to the stake, standing bound on the pyre above the crowd. The fire wizard lifts his hands, throws back his head, and begins to dance in triumphant celebration. He is an ogre of glee, chortling, shooting flames, flashing now light, now dark, calling the night unto himself until the people of Enchanted City gasp for air. They choke, and the head of the sacrificial one droops lower. The enchanter dances one complete circuit around the pyre, then stops and bows in mockery. The burners hold their glowing pokers at salute. The death drums roll in unison again. The ghastly breakers raise their cudgels. Death to pretenders. The spoken words are soft. All lean forward to hear. The fire priests swing from the pyre to the ashes below, except for one who waits to light the stacked wood. Death to pretenders. A wind starts to blow, raising ash dust. Death to pretenders! A torch is lit. The priest touches it to the pyre. The flames burst into the night. They whoosh, they burn, they leap higher and higher. The wild wind roars, feeding the conflagration. The shadow at the stake lifts, arches, raises its head, and is crowned with burning. The enchanter is a writhing, frenzied silhouette before the fire. He lifts his distorted face to the flames. Ah, wa, wa, ha, ah, wa, ha, ha. The howl of a beast over its prey. Ah, wa, ha, ha. But each common man stands pierced to the soul, watching the crackling flames, the leaping cinders, the chorus of fire singing raucously upon the pyre. For all know now, though they may forget it tomorrow, the wizard will feel joy at any burning place, at any death time, at any agony of final passing. He will preside in gleeful dance at any dying. At this moment, out of the flame, some say out of the shadows in the middle of the flame, an intense light blazes. More than fire, more than burning, it explodes out over them, cracking the gathering darkness, splitting it momentarily before its dawn time, bursting with such ferocity that all shield their eyes and hide their faces and turn their backs from the center. Just as suddenly it is night again, blackest of blackest night, in despair, People begin to leave, feeling their way in the terrible darkness back to their hovels, to the hidden hideaways of this city of unspeakable doom. Death has done what it always will do. A young woman stands disbelieving at the edge of the shadows. Once madness captured her in its carnival circle, tossing her round and round in its ceaseless, unhappy endings. Then a man came into the center of her torture and looked into her eyes, bringing sanity and giving her a reason to look deeply into the eyes of any man or woman. And what is left for her? Madness again? Two young men, friends, support each other and stand at a distance before the pyre. They strangle on their tears. Into the cold depths of their underworld, a man had come and led them into the warmth of light 
and had taught them to sing the joyous whole melody of the partial tune they had only feebly hummed. Will there ever be music again? Will the musicians tune their instruments and the orchestra play? Will the dancers step the steps once more and laugh as they dance? Or will the song never again be sung? A beautiful woman with flaxen hair falls to her knees in the ash dust. Will she never again act out stories in the streets? Will the tales of love and courage be forgotten? Will she never more speak the rhymes of peace, the poetry of hope, the prose of power? Will the memory of the tale be broken, the most wonderful story of all locked away in the archives, never to be retold? Two boys pray together, but no words come. Will language again be crooked, halting, tongue-tied? Will the words all be twisted, stammered, and backwards? Will mouths swell and spew forth wickedness? Will goodness never again find speech? In the darkness a crowd begins to gather, a throng, all those who have loved and served the king, all those who have worked in the resistance, each man, woman, and child, who ever dared to believe in the breaking of enchantments or dared to hope in a future restoration. All who longed for the exile to end now stand mourning in the shadows of the death of all dreams and try to remember light and song and life. The keeper of the chronicle of sightings of the king stands silent, too, stripped of hope, ravaged. The enchanter is the victor after all, death his second in command. There is no such thing as a kingdom, he thinks. Great Park is only make-believe. Mercy, caretaker, ranger, commander. We are all just pretenders. I'm no hero, nor a king's man. The city saying is true. There is no such thing as a king. This is, and will ever be, the keep of the great enchanter. He holds the handle of the hatchet by his side, feeling no power. We have tricked ourselves, he thinks, and casts the tool to the ground. Then he sits in the ashes, his heart too much of stone for weeping. He stares at the gathering crowd, shadows in the blackness. Why are they here? It's all over. We all are orphans, all ugly, deformed scarboys, sewer rats and boiler brats, carnival girls, heralds of untruth. And we must all return to Enchanted City, this place of the no people. The time for heroics is ended. He sits motionless. He sleeps but sees no visions. Numb, he rests not. He wakes to darkness. No day comes. Will this night never end? All is done, over never to be again a forever unhappiness. In the night he thinks that the shadows, forms deeper than the substance of darkness, creep closer to the pyre, which rises black, a rubble of twisted cinder and charcoal in the middle of burning place. Someone stands beside him and reaches to him a hand. It is an old, old woman, more bent than ever, the grasp now feeble. It's mercy. Why are you here? he asks her, motioning to the shadows. Must all who love him come? Her voice is weak. Her answer sounds far away. Yes, all who love the king must come to this place, before they can see the restoration begin.
He wants to scoff. He wants to shout, silence. But an eye is caught by a tiny glow on the pyre. Embers that are not completely burned. Others in the gathered congregation of shadows see it too. They gasp. Peering, he rises to his knees. But wait. The glow suddenly becomes a flame. One small warm ring of light. Not an angry, destroying rage, but a good burning. A flower flame, growing strangely larger and larger, unfolding upon itself, petals of soft fire, layer upon layer, opening outward, white, rose, golden, glowing. In this sudden light, he can see that the shadows are the people of Great Park who have stood in the darkness, waiting, waiting. Here is a band of rangers in forest garb, the orphans newly arrived, their faces scrubbed but filled with anxiety. He spies Amanda. This has been a night of anguish for her. Her face is haggard, but her eyes, they seem to be filled with sight. And beyond them all, strange forms of soft, almost indistinguishable luminescence. As the flower of flame grows, he sees his comrades from the taxi resistance, people of the city, brave men and women whose faces are now filling with wonder. Nearby stands caretaker, his back straightening in the warmth of the new flame. Then, out of the center of the lovely burning light, a laugh. His heart leaps. He has heard that laugh before. His being lurches with hope. It's the laugh of the king. All stare into the middle of the death field, into the flaming flower, their mouths agape, their eyes open wide. A form is taking shape in the middle of the pistols and the stamen. A real form is rising from the burning center. It gathers unto itself, becoming distinct, definite, firm. The watchers narrow their vision in order to see better what they can scarcely believe they are seeing. It is the king, the king. He stands tall, stands bold. He stamps a foot, sending flames dancing into the night. He lifts his arms in exultation. He throws back his head and laughs. The challenger, the conqueror, laughs, the first laugh of creation, again and again and again. Suddenly, in the middle of that blackest night, right at midnight, when stars, moon, and planets are utterly dimmed by enchantment, the day comes. Light splits the darkness again. Day falls on enchanted city. Shafts of glorious light, brilliant rays of brightness, dawning come untimely. And the king in the center of the burning field lifts his face to the warm new sun, and at that the flowering fire quiets, and the king steps from the flames. And all see at once that he is the meaning of the dance, he is the other side of the death place. His word weaves universe out of chaos. He is the restorer of all lost cities. His life is the potion all must take against enchantment. The great crowd of subjects of the king ring burning place. A circle, a great vast circle, stretches around the dusty rim of the death field. They join hands, reaching to their neighbor, young to old, woman to man, adult to child. From the center of the burning flower, quieted but still luxuriant with light, the familiar music begins. It is the music of the great celebration. Ah! They have heard this before. Ah, slowly, very slowly, the great circle begins to turn.
Hero watches the graceful movements. But the people are not changed. Is becoming over? Will we never be real again, he wonders, become who we really are? Hero, a ranger friend calls. Are you no longer dancing? The music quickens as the king in the center stoops and lifts an armful of flame which shimmers and flutters in his embrace, alive. And as the dance passes, he tosses a flower to this one, to that, until the whole moving ring is filled with brilliant light. Like comets, like galaxies of orbiting moons, and Hero watches as each one becomes, not passing through the circle of sacred flames, but being passed through themselves by holy light as the shining fires disappear only to shine brightly from each one's eyes. Then the king, the king himself, cries to Hero, Keeper of the Chronicle, Light! And when he turns his face, it is then that Hero sees the mark. A scar new from the burning, a scar like his own, but not like it. It is not the enchanter's mark, not stamped into the flesh by hot iron. It is like a flower high on the cheekbone, like a crown, like a red and perfect rose. Lifting his hand to his face, Hero discovers that the rough, fleshly rim of his own scar has disappeared. The mark of branding has been forever healed. Overwhelmed, all Hero can do is laugh. The enchantment truly is broken, and his feet almost despite themselves, begin to step to the music, and he draws himself up, proud, standing tall, a subject of the king, this most beautiful of men, alive. And he is proud to be called a king's man. Light, he calls back. The king tosses the dancing fire his way, and Hero's head is bathed in warmth as he feels the wonderful homespun wool of the cloak of ranger blue falling around his shoulders, and he is lighted through and through. He breathes the sudden, cool air of great park, fragrant with field and flower. He looks into the eye of street urchin and orphan, and they are truly beautiful. And his soul feels bold. At heart he knows he is a man of courage. Nearby, Mercy's luxuriant black hair falls to her waist. She is once again the most beautiful of women. Ranger commander, strong, broad-shouldered and grand, bows to his warrior wife. Amanda, in her royal garments, dances in the ring way across the field. Hero watches as the circle moves closer, and he sees the old gladsome laughter in her eyes. He meets her to take her hand and to join the dance beside her as they all, subjects of the kingdom, laugh and sing and step the sacred steps round and round this most royal highness, his majesty, the king. It is only then, when the circle is finally fulfilled, and each one he loves has become real with sacred starshine in their eyes, that the king himself turns in motion to the sweet, solemn, and glorious music of Great Park. Then, while his own eyes shine with day, he lifts his hands to the light, and in this first morning of the beginning again of all time, he proclaims aloud, The enchantment is broken. Let the restoration begin.